After the Great War of 2077, the world as we know it is no more than a barren, unrecognizable post-apocalyptic wasteland. The air is filled with deadly radiation, skeletons litter the land, iconic buildings were turned to rubble, and advertisements lay dormant displaying a world that once was. Not completely void of life, humanity lived on, however, in much smaller numbers. Emerging from what was known as the vaults, humanity as well as mutated individuals tried to rebuild society back to the way they wanted, still with the American dream in mind. However, not all of humanity shared this goal. Factions started to form, all stating their different intents for this new world. The Brotherhood of Steel, the Khans, the Vipers, the Blades, and many more set up their own settlements and started to plan their rebuilding of America. As well as that, mutants also set up their own settlements with their own intentions, with cities such as Necropolis or the City of the Dead being a safe haven for ghouls and super mutants, wanting to have peace away from the abuse of humans who wanted to wipe them off the surface of the earth. Because of these factions all having different intentions to rebuild the America that once was, wars broke out because, well, war never changes. But outside of all these factions was a secret organization, one that was never really seen by anyone within the new America, one only known by the name of the Enclave, thanks to their propaganda spread throughout the lands. This organization would have a dark history dating back to before the Great War, and their idea of what the perfect America would be would mean the near extinction of anyone that was not part of their exclusive group. But who were the Enclave? How did they set up? Where are they based? And what was their true plan for rebuilding the Commonwealth States of America? Well, in today's video, we explore the dark, mysterious, and deadly faction known as the Enclave. Humanity has always had this idea that the ones in power are never truly the ones pulling the strings. Conspiracy theories date back to almost pre-Roman times, believing that there are always people behind governments who are the ones really in control of what happens to society and the people who live in these countries. We have seen a rise in conspiracy theories within the last 200 years or so, with people believing that organizations like the Illuminati, the Freemasons, and of course the Stonecutters actually control everything from behind the scenes and the public never know what their true intentions are. Whilst we can't rule out these conspiracy theories because, well, if they were a secret organization, they wouldn't exactly tell us. In the Fallout universe, these conspiracy theories of a secret organization running America was pretty accurate. And before anything happened in terms of global nuclear war, the individuals working behind the scenes within government were known as the Enclave. The Enclave split into multiple roles, consisting of individuals who were the best in their field. These would be military generals, extremely influential politicians, prize-winning scientists like Roanoke Gaming, wealthy industrialists, and other extremely powerful men and women. To these individuals, they were an assembly of the greatest minds on American soil, and without them, the country would simply just not be the country it is today. Their technology would not be where it is today, and honestly, they probably thought the country would collapse if it wasn't for them. The world at this time, however, was suffering from depleting natural resources used to power society societies, and because of this, war was looming in the air. America was holding most of the remaining oil reserves, and it became a target for most of the other big superpowers, most notably China, who were the dominant force at this time. This sparked what was known as the Sino-American War. As this brutal war went on, the Enclave devised a contingency plan. They knew that this war was only going to get worse, and would most likely lead to nuclear war. With this information, they kept it secret and started using their corporate and government money to get out the country to make sure they survive the coming war. If they were to survive the war that was quickly approaching, they would still be able to run their shadow government and continue to wage war against their enemy, utilizing their technology and money to be the dominant force within the world and keeping America pure. The Enclave set up new bases outside of the mainland. Their strongest foothold was on the oil rig out within the Pacific Ocean, which was owned by Poseidon Oil. Here they would set it up as the presidential oil rig and would have the congressional bunker acting as the base of operations for the Enclave. Other facilities set up were Raven Rock, the Enclave's main base of operations within the capital wasteland, and Kovac Muldoon platform, not a settlement, but an automated support platform located in the orbit above Appalachia. The Enclave, however, didn't just focus on themselves during this time. They did in fact devise a plan to save the American public from the nuclear fallout and came up with Project Safe House. However, Project Safe House was not as safe as it sounds. The intention 
here from the Enclave was to set up nuclear shelters for the public. And when they eventually went into these vaults, they would be experimented on in a variety of different ways, with each having their own goal. This would help the Enclave see how far humanity could be pushed physically and mentally before they either went mad, mutated or lost their lives. How did they pay for all this though? Well, that's all thanks to the then lone secretary, Thomas Eckhart, who was part of the Department of Agriculture. Eckhart embezzled all the funds from that sector and used it to build their base of operations. For the vaults, however, the Enclave teamed up with Vault Tech Industries, a defense corporation who had the technology and the funds to make their plans work effectively. The Enclave had such incredible technology that they were able to watch over all the vaults from their presidential oil rig all the way out within the Pacific Ocean. From here they could manipulate the tests and make sure everything was going the way they planned, all from the comfort of their safe house. The Great War came in 2077 and by March it was clear that the nuclear war was about to hit American soil. The Enclave along with the President started retreating to their set up shelters with the plan of the shadow government taking over the role to dictate what happened with in this war. However, before this could happen, insiders within the government and within the public sector became aware of this hidden organization trying to take over the role of government. Unaware for years of this faction, rumors were spreading around more and more about how they were controlling everything. The only way to join the Enclave was to be invited by one of their members, and because of this, a lot of government insiders started to notice groups forming away from them, clearly planning stuff on their own. Trying to expose this hidden organization to the wider public, journalists started getting involved as well, trying to get the secret out about this corrupt organization that had been stealing funds from the government to fund their own exploits. Sam Blackwell, a United States Senator, started an investigation into this group and how they were gaining funds as well as utilizing vault Tech to start Project Safehouse, as well as its true intentions. However, Blackwell found himself on the receiving end of threats, with the Enclave members targeting his daughter. Because because of this, Blackwell vanished for a bit, but dramatically returned and stated within the Charleston Herald that there are sinister forces at work within the halls of government. I simply could not be a part of that anymore. On the 19th of October up until the 23rd, the Boston Bugle followed this controversy by exposing the Enclave through the reports made by Mags Vecchio. In it, he was able to locate where the president had moved and where this mysterious group known as the Enclave was set up, that being the oil rig off the coast of California. Suddenly, this shadow government that was heavily militarized had a name and the public became aware of who was in control. That was the Enclave. But before anything could be done, the nuclear bombs had arrived. The old world was destroyed and America became a post-apocalyptic wasteland. The Enclave and their members retreated to safety and started their plans to rebuild immediately. The remaining members of government, however, did not follow them in their survival. Some officials were too slow to react and did not make it to the congressional bunker. Some missed the call to get there, whereas others were just dropped off the list of officials granted access for unknown reasons. Some of the members of Congress who did make it but weren't a part of the Enclave were gunned down outside the bunker by automated turrets. Only the Enclave could live on. The Enclave continued to live on as if nothing had happened to the wider population. They continued to live the exact same way they had been living in America, under the rule of a president who was democratically voted in and then surrounded by a clear hierarchy system in play with a Congress in play as well. To them, they are the pure continuation of the pre-war Commonwealth states of America. To them, however, every citizen outside of their ranks in society was deemed non-American citizens, even if they were born within the country itself. To them, the Enclave were the only members of America, and everyone else were outsiders. Now living in their safe havens away from the effects of the nuclear fallout, the Enclave started rebuilding and working on their technologies to help their war effort. Unfortunately for them, communications suddenly stopped between all of their outposts. The main oil rig of their operations lost communication with the base within Appalachia, meaning they were completely on their own. The same applied to Raven's Rock as well. Eckhart realized that they now had no main authority telling them 
them what to do and thought it was time to appoint someone as the role of president. Eckhart put himself forward for this role and knew he could win over the members of the Enclave. However, Eckhart still held very strong views against communism and wanted to hit back against China for what they had done, without having any real evidence to what had happened to China after the war. Because no one else had authority because of the lack of communication within the oil rig outpost, Eckhart was put in charge of a device known as MODUS. MODUS was a multi-operational directions and utility system, which would help maintain the White Spring Bunker and help maintain the Appalachia Enclave Bunker. It was an incredibly powerful tool that would do anything its operator wished. Eckhart put in his hat to become the president of the Enclave and president of America. He pitched his idea to all of the members of the Appalachia Bunker about getting rid of all communist involvement. He separated those who agreed with his idea from those who didn't. Those who didn't were put to one side of the room. Eckhart then left them and told Modus to seal the doors and suffocate them, erasing all opposition to him. Because of this, he was now the self-proclaimed President of America and the Enclave. President Thomas Eckhart, once Secretary of Agriculture, was now in full rule of the Appalachian Enclave and with no communication with the main base of operations of the Enclave, was free to do what he wanted within his group. Whilst his reign only really lasted less than a decade, Eckhart was absolutely brutal in his rule and completely tore apart all of the area they inhabited. Determined to be rid of communism and China more specifically, Eckhart devised a plan to use Appalachia's automated nuclear missile silos to deliver more nuclear attacks on China to make sure it was completely wiped off all of the earth. But he had a problem. See, because it was fully automated, it had to have a reason to set off the nukes. It couldn't just allow them to be fired. There had to be a clear reason and proof that it was under threat to activate DEFCON 1, which if you don't know, is basically nuclear missile party time. Eckhart needed to activate this, so he came up with a plan. He activated thousands of Liberator robots used by the People's Liberation Army of China all over Appalachia, as well as releasing super mutants and scorch beasts, huge bat-like creatures which were created by the Enclave themselves. But these creatures weren't just deadly up close, they also carried a virulent plague on them, which would go on to infect individuals and control living creatures. This was not intentional by the Enclave, however. Whilst they created the beast, they did not mean to infect them with this deadly virus. Because of this clear violation of power by Eckhart and putting everyone in the area at risk of total extinction thanks to these deadly creatures, a bloody civil war started, with some of the Enclave members siding with General Ellen Santiago, a military leader of the Enclave who was stationed within Washington DC on the eve of the Great War, before moving to Appalachia. This war saw the end of the Enclave involvement within Appalachia. The Scorch Beasts were just too strong, as well as the Super Mutants and the Liberators. Some of Santiago's soldiers needed to take the fight to the thing controlling everything within the bunker and the thing at the heart of Appalachia, Modus. They got to Modus, pushing through the bunker, but the AI defended itself. Despite it being slightly damaged due to explosives, Modus was still operational and activated the bunker's defenses, sealing everyone in and filling it with poisonous gas. The Enclave presence within Appalachia was no more. In the heart of 2086, all life within the Enclave branch was wiped out, all thanks to the self-proclaimed president, Thomas Eckhart, and his goal of wiping out China once and for all. With the Appalachia branch now fully wiped out, only Modus was the final survivor of the Enclave, and now the AI was in full control, it started repairing everything within the bunker that was caused by the Civil War. In 2102, it finally met humans again, as it tried to recruit both a lone dweller from Vault 76 and US Army Captain Oliver Fields in 2103. But after this event, the Enclave remained dormant. Their presence on mainland soil seemed non-existent, and nothing really happened on their end that was of massive importance. Importance. It was not until 2140 where the Enclave started up again and devised another plan to rebuild their pure America, which they believed they were part of and also believed that they were the only ones to do it. Before the Great War, the Enclave really worked hard on making huge technological advancements. One of them was many variations of the classic T-51 power armor. Post Great War, however, the Enclave research slowed right down and some of their projects failed to really improve. However, in 2215, under the new president of D 
Dick Richardson, the Enclave's research effort catapulted into action once again. New infantry armor was made for ground troops and was finished within the year of 2220. In 2235, they worked on the Deathclaw, originally a creature made by the American government and not the Enclave specifically, but was experimented on even more by the Enclave to try and make it far more deadlier to their enemies. But it was in 2236 where the Enclave encountered something that would change them going forward. On July 20th, Enclave scouts found an old military base within Mariposa. The troops started evacuating the base along with slaves the Enclave had captured. During this excavation, the Enclave found a mound as Melchior from the town of Reading who had been exposed to the virus known as FEV, which was used during the Great War to mutate combatants and turn them into what we now know as super mutants. Realizing that it wasn't long until he fully mutated and was killed by the Enclave, Melchior began stealing weapons from the Enclave and handing them to all the other mutated citizens who had now turned into mutants. During this, in 2237, the excavation team were able to retrieve a pure sample of FEV and leave the base. But before they could, the mutants rose up against their Enclave masters. The Enclave suffered heavily from this and had to retreat, but on their retreat, they sealed the mutants in the ruins of the facility. Whilst Melchior and his mutants were happy they had fought back against the Enclave, this was not good news. Soon after this encounter, the Enclave would go on to create a biological agent that would allow the Enclave to kill all mutants all over the world. This was known as FEV Curling 13. The chances of this agent working on wiping out all life around the globe was 99.5% extermination rate. The Enclave continued to experiment on infected individuals, trying to make sure everything was ready for their purification of the globe. Everything was going to plan and the chemical was ready to be released worldwide. However, the Enclave were unexpectedly attacked by an unknown individual, only known as the Chosen One. This Chosen One invaded the main oil rig, assassinated President Dick Richardson, as well as everyone else of importance, and triggered a nuclear detonation, destroying all of the toxin supply. Thanks to this chosen one, the Enclave's plan of purifying the planet was stopped. Millions of lives were saved, and their global genocide plan came to an end. They were defeated. However, this wasn't the last we saw of the Enclave. Now with their main base of operations destroyed, their outpost in Appalachia ruined, and without their main communications, the Enclave looked defeated. The only real place of note the Enclave could see was Navarro, within New California. However, something unexpected happened. They were suddenly contacted by a new president under the name of John Henry Eden, who ordered all remaining Enclave forces in the West Coast to relocate to the capital wasteland within the old Washington, D.C. Most left for Washington, D.C., however, few stayed within Navarro. But with the strong presence of the NCR army, the Enclave within Navarro became scattered and most attempted to integrate into the NCR, but most were unsuccessful. Now fully regrouped within the capital wasteland, the Enclave set back up within Raven Rock, rearming and manufacturing more resources for their fight to take back America. The Enclave were able to create new robots that would help them in their fights as well as more advanced iBots which would roam the wasteland, spreading propaganda and trying to excite inhabitants of the wasteland that America was going to return to the way it was. Through their technology and force, the Enclave's goal, or more specifically Colonel Augustus Autumn's goal, was to convince the public that they were the good guys and they were rebuilding the country for them, earning them the public's respect and turning America back into the America it was pre-war. However, their new president still wanted to fulfill the original plan, which was to purify the country and make sure that anyone that was mutated or supposedly tainted by radiation of the FEV was erased from the globe. But there was one problem. Another faction known as the Brotherhood of Steel were showing themselves to be the more preferable faction for the public as they had set up their project known as Project Purity, a campaign that would aim to bring drinkable water to all of the residents of the capital wasteland. The Enclave invaded the project and set up a perimeter capturing it from the Brotherhood of Steel, but their effort was sabotaged by the creator of the project known as James. 
Here he exposed himself to the lethal amounts of radiation, killing himself but wiping out many Enclave soldiers in the process, trying to protect his project. But somehow the Enclave survived and were able to keep Project Purity for themselves. With this project, President Eden could use the modified FEV within the water supply and cleanse the wasteland of all mutants and anyone believed to be tainted. But both Autumn and Eden needed one thing for this project to work, the device known as the Gek. Without this Garden of Eden creation kit, their plan to cleanse the globe would not work. During this search, the Enclave goes on to capture a lone wanderer who had ventured into Vault 87 to capture the Gek. During his capture, President John Henry Eden asked the lone wanderer to install the modified FEV and help them with their ultimate goal. The lone wanderer being the child of James, the maker of the project, however, objected to this and went against their plan. With this, the Enclave plan was gone and now they were on the back foot. The Brotherhood of Steel also created a pre-war machine codenamed Liberty Prime and utilized this huge robot to take out multiple Enclave strongholds, including Raven Rock, the Enclave's last base of operations. Whilst the Enclave hit back, destroying Liberty Prime with a rocket barrage from orbit, they were now scattered with only one base to retreat to. Their final stronghold was at Adams, but they were now extremely weak and vulnerable to attacks. The Brotherhood were quick to hit them, utilizing all of their firepower. The Lone One Wanderer helped with this fight and helped the Brotherhood engage the overhead weapons orbiting the planet. They set the target, and the missiles fell, obliterating the Adams base and all of the Enclave within it. As the ash scattered to the floor, the Enclave were defeated once again, and their presence within the capital wasteland was no more. The year is 2281 and the Enclave's presence is almost non-existent. With no base within the capital wasteland, the soldiers remaining there were completely scattered. Navarro had now been taken over by the NCR and the remaining soldiers who had been captured from this area were either allowed into the ranks, although this was extremely rare, or were tried for war crimes. There are rumours of a squad within the Mojave wasteland, although they are keeping out of sight waiting for a final attack order to come through to them. In the east, however, there is only one survivor known who fought under Autumn and Eden. This man is known as Brian Richter, a man who was left for dead during a recon mission. Now retreating away from where he was left, Richter is a devout follower of the Atom out in the Mount Desert Island and is labelled as a zealot for his religion with no affiliation with the Enclave. That is the only known remnant of the Enclave left and it is unsure if they will ever reform and try and purify the globe again. But there is one thing left of the Enclave still going that hasn't rusted away or has changed its affiliation. That thing is the iBot known as EDE. This iBot was sent out just before the obliteration of the Adams Air Force Base. EDE was meant to be sent to Navarro going through Illinois, unaware that Navarro had now fallen. It is unknown where EDE is now or if it is still going, but if it is, Maybe its propaganda is still playing, and maybe it will reach a small outpost of remaining loyal Enclave soldiers, waiting for a fight. Maybe EDE will bring about the return of the Enclave. But for now, it is pretty certain that the force that once was is just ashes scattered over the capital wasteland where their shadow government once formed. And that's the full lore of the mysterious dark group known as the Enclave. Will they return in future Fallout games? And what do you think they will plan to do if they do return? Let me know in the comments below. I hope you all enjoyed this video and I really apologize for the long delay. My mic broke, so I had to get a new setup and hopefully it sounds all good. I'm still struggling with some settings. And if you did like this, why not give it a like and subscribe if you haven't already? And why not check out all of my other lore videos? The links are in the description below. I'll also leave my Twitter Discord and Twitch links if you want to support me even further as well as my Patreon for if you really really want to support this channel. And speaking of, I'd like to thank my supporters real quick. Big thanks to our big fish Duquesne23 and Rhinohead, our Sharks Connor, Ryan Garnum and the AVP Man and our huge Megalodons Sinus JJD 896 and Wild well Such Gaming. Also big thanks to our YouTube channel member our wise one Jambu as well as all my subscribers on Twitch. Thank you all so much for the continued support, it means the world to me. But that is all for now thanks for watching again and i shall see you all in the next one cheers <laughs>